Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the NTMA 2017 webinar series. Today's webinar is Heat Treating Today's Tool Steels, and it's presented by Rob Simons of Paulo. To avoid any distractions, all of the attendees have been muted. If you have any questions or comments during the webinar, please feel free to use the question or the chat box on the right of your screen. Uh, there will be a Q&A following the presentation. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to Phil Harris, the Marketing Manager at Palo. Thanks, Pam. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, like Pam said, I'm the Marketing Manager for Palo. It means I put Rob up to doing things like this. Um, so we'd like to welcome you all, and, and hopefully you find uh, the presentation today useful. Um, Rob's your guy. You've got 35 years of e-trader experience, 30 of that is with us. Um, and tool fields are what he eats and drinks every day. Um, if you don't know about Paula, we've got five locations. We're primarily a heat treater. We also do brazing and metal finishing. Uh, we have locations throughout the Midwest, Southeast, and up in the Great Lakes area of Cleveland. Um, so without further ado, here's Rob. Um, we will be both around at the end to take any questions you have. Thank you. I would like to thank everybody for joining the webinar. I'm Rob Simons, the manager of Metallurgical Engineering at Paula. I've been here for almost 30 years now, and I've seen lots of change in the tool steel industry. We're going to talk about tool steels, the manufacturer, their treatment, and what is important for a tool's performance. Our focus will be on vacuum heat treatment. We've been given a unique material. Steel is one of the few materials that you can use to cut steel. When we look at tool steels, most have carbon levels around 0.35 to 2.0. There's a few exceptions. Most of the P mold steels are under 0.35 carbon. These are oil quenched steels, so they're really out of the scope of our discussion. There's a couple of fairly rare cold works above 2.0 carbon. Steels contain alloying elements. These alloys provide both hardenability for the tool steel and carbides for wear resistance. Most common are chrome, vanadium, moly, and tungsten. These elements help provide primary carbide for wear resistance. We're going to focus on their manufacturing of tool steels for some of the grades, how they are made is very critical to the performance. What is important is removing the inclusions from the steel and the control of the size and the shape of the carbide in the microstructure. There are lots of groups of tool steels. Some are outside of our soap today as they are not heat treated in vacuum. Oil hardening seals like O2 and the P-series mold grades are oil quenched. There are way more groups than are water listed here. These are just the most common ones. S7 is the most common shock resistant steel. These steels can take quite a bit of abuse without fracturing. They are very tough. Cold work steels are used for fabricating other steel parts. Most common is A2 and D2. Hot work steels are used in forging dyes and also in die casting of light metals like zinc and aluminum. Stainless steels are used in mold applications and food processing. Most common are 420 and 440C. High speeds are considered to be extremely hard alloys. They are very complex with two distinct groups, those based on molly, which is most common like M2, and those based on tungsten, which are rarely used. And finally, your powdered metal special purpose alloys. Most mills have tailored alloys into special applications your powder metal grades definitely fall into this category. There is always a trade-off between strength and ductility. To have one, you give up the other. There are exceptions, but that is the general rule. This is a visual aid. The x-axis is wear resistance. As you move to the right, these materials are more wear resistant. The y-axis is toughness. As you move up, these materials are tougher. As you look at S7, you can see it is a very tough grade, but not very wear resistant. D2 is at the other end of the spectrum, wear resistant, but not very tough. You can break down popular tool steels into two main groups. Those that have carbide, this is A2, the white phase in the micrographs is a complex wear resistant primary carbide. And those that don't have carbides, notice the uniform microstructure of H13. I will be showing several micrographs during the presentation. For reference purposes, all were originally taken between 200 and 500 X magnification. Tools steels with carbide. What are your primary carbide-containing materials? 
These are your cold works, your A2, your D2. These are your high speeds, your M2 and your M42 are the most common. Your 440C stainless. Most of the powder metal grades fall into the group. There's a very good reason why carbide grades are prevalent in powder metal based steels, and we will talk about it. These are your high wear grades. There is, wear, there is way more wear than just the hardness of the tool. The carbide size, shape, and distribution are critical. Notice all the carbides in the V2, way more than what was in the A2 you just saw. Please take a close look at this micrograph. We are going to compare it to another micrograph in just a little bit. Tool steels without carbide. These are your tough materials. Why? There's no brittle carbide, only matrix. In your shock resistant, again, the most common is S7. Your hot works, most common is H13. There's some H11 and other special purpose alloys that are used in the aluminum high pressure die casting industry. Your 420 stainless, your mold steels, as discussed, most of those are going to be oil quench materials. These are your tough alloys, shown as S7. We're going to briefly touch on how tool steels are made. The different methods can have a dramatic impact on the tool's performance. The electric arc furnace is the most common way today to make tool steels in the United States. Scrap is loaded into an electric arc furnace. Graphite electrodes are used to conduct electricity through the scrap and melt it. You can see the electrodes in this picture. They are the large cylindrical objects that are going on. Next, the molten scrap is transferred to one or more labels where the chemistry is adjusted to the specific grade. Once the chemistry is in range, they are transferred to the pour deck where they are cast into ingots. The best casting method is bottom casting. The steel is poured into a funnel that is plumbed to the bottom of the ingot mold. This helps reduce turbulence and impurities in the casting. Why is forging necessary? It's all about how the steel solidifies. Different elements solidify at different temperatures. This results in regions that are rich in one element and lean in another, resulting in a non-uniform structure. Here's how steel solidifies. This is actually shrinkage porosity, but you can see how solidification works. Pretend the black center is still molten steel. As it cools, you can see the tree-like dendrites starting to form. In carbide-containing steels, these tree-like structures form first, and they are lean and alloy and carbon. So where is that carbide? As it cools more, the alloy and carbon-rich phases form. This is your carbide. This is as cast D2. This was from a small part, not a large ingot, so the carbide networks are relatively small. Compare this to the D2 micrograph I asked you to remember. This as cast D2 now has an interconnected network of brittle carbide. The crack can very easily follow this path. This is the reason for forging to break up these carbides. The large ingot is reheated in massive furnaces. The manipulators that look like they belong in a transformer movie hold the ingot while it is forged to final size. This forging works the steel and breaks up the carbides. Like needing two different colors of Play-Doh together, they become one more uniform color. The more the ingot is worked, the more uniform the final structure. Here's another way to get smaller carbides in a much cleaner steel. The clean steel is tougher. This is an electro-slag remelter, or ESR. Ingots take a very long time to solidify. This results in more segregation in the steel and larger primary carbides. For ESR, the ingot is remelted into a slag pool. This helps remove impurities and the steel re-solidifies much faster than the original ingot. This results in a more uniform final structure and carbide distribution. Vacuum arc remelting, or VAR, is similar to ESR. The main difference is it is done under vacuum, which removes even more impurities. The powder metal grade produces the best possible carbide distribution in the final product. These grades cost a lot, and here's why. The alloy is melted into a crucible. It is poured into an atomization chamber. Here the steel is atomized with an inert gas. Basically, each little particle is its own ending. The small size and rapid solidification prevents any carbide networking. These particles are then placed into a capsule. The capsule is welded up. It is in hot isostatic press, or hit. This uses extreme heat and pressure to close up any pores between the particles. The hit alloy is rolled to final size and sold as far product. Let's look at what happens with powder metal grades. 
There is nothing we can do in heat treatment to change the carbide networks for these grades containing primary carbide. This micrograph shows them to high speed. Notice there is very little breaking up of the existing carbide network. Heat treatment can influence secondary carbides, and we will talk more about that in a minute. Here is a view of TPM 9D. The carbides are small and finely distributed. Notice they are very spherical. Having carbide in a spheroidal form does a couple things. There is no path for a crack to follow, and there's no sharp edges to act as stress concentrators. Both of these characteristics dramatically improve toughness. Now the steel has been made, you have made your components, let's talk about what happens next. Again, our focus here is high pressure vacuum furnace processing. If parts are in the vacuum, there's nothing present to react with the surface of the steel. Here's the part that we analyzed that was processed in a tooling purpose. Oil wrapping helps, but it does not prevent reactions from occurring. We were analyzing this part because it cracked its tool shop. The cause of the crack is this layer of decarburization. The decarburized layer does not expand as much as the material under the layer, and this can result in very high tensile stresses, thus resulting in a potential crack. Another reason to process in a vacuum furnace is we can program very complex thermal cycles. We will give a couple examples coming up. We can also measure what the part is doing, not just the furnace itself. This is critical for all tool steels, but vital for high speeds. Let's talk about some of the features of a vacuum furnace. Here is the hearth itself. The work is loaded on an alloy skid and placed in the center of the hearth. Heat is applied with heating elements. These are usually made of graphite, but some furnaces the heating elements can be made of molly. After the parts properly osmotized, the chamber is back filled with a gas, usually nitrogen. This nitrogen is circulated by high horsepower motors and contacts the workloads through the quench nozzles. The gas then passes over a heat exchanger and is recirculated again. Since we load the chamber at room temperature, we can place load thermocouples in the actual work itself. We have high pressure vacuum furnaces in our St. Louis, Kansas City, and Nashville facilities. Our maximum capacity furnace is located in St. Louis. This furnace has 450 kilowatts of heating power and a hearth that can handle up to 8,000 pounds. It can be backfilled up to 20 bar, that's 300 PSIA of nitrogen gas. Once backfilled with nitrogen, the gas is circulated with a 725 horsepower fan and cooled with a 14 million BTU heat exchanger. What is heat treatment? Before we dive into details, let's briefly outline what happens during heat treatment. The first step of the process involves a preheating. This is actually done in the vacuum furnace itself. The tools have been osmotized, a necessary step before hardening. They are then quenched. It's material dependent, but quenching to 150 degrees is the most common. The tools are then tempered after they harden. This is done with separate equipment. Parts can be tempered in vacuum, but it has to be a very special circumstance. You can mix different steels together if they are heat treated by the same recipe. We'll touch base on that in a minute. But you do have to follow some common sense rules. We have work instructions for these rules. There are different rules for different materials, but usually you want to keep cross sections uniform within an inch or two. Here are some tools that are two inches thick. And here are some that are eight inches thick. You would not want to run these together. Make sure your heat treater is not doing this. Instrumenting work. As mentioned, vacuum furnace processing gives us the ability to measure the actual temperature of the part, not just the temperature of the furnace. Core thermocouples are used to make sure we properly heat the part during both preheating and osmotizing. We are measuring the temperature of the actual tool in the center of its mass. Surface thermocouples are present to assist in measuring the quench rate of the cycle. On some materials, especially those used in high pressure die casting applications, measurement of quench rate is a specification requirement. Here's how we instrument the workload. There's multiple tools in the cycle, we will usually instrument more than one representative part. For the surface measurement, we will place a thermocouple 5 8 deep in a hole if we are not provided with a dedicated thermocouple hole. Providing dedicated holes is more common than you may think, and is a very good idea. For the core thermocouple, we find a hole that reaches the center mass of the part. We want to make sure that it is properly osmotized. 
We pack both locations with furnace insulation. This helps provide more accurate measurements. The objective of preheating is to reduce the thermal gradient between the surface and the core of the part. The primary purpose of this step is to help reduce distortion and movement. Be sure your heat treater is performing this step on your work. On this example, it is for a material used in high pressure die casting applications. For this work, there are two preheats, one at 1250 and one at 1550. Here you can see the difference between the surface and core thermocouples. Naturally, the surface thermocouple is hotter than the core thermocouple. In this example, a 1500 pound insert is being preheated. Once the core is heated to 400 degrees, the surface is at 600 degrees. If preheats were not used, the thermal difference between the surface and the core would continue to increase. Osmotizing. This is a very critical step in heat treatment. Different materials have different rules. For this high pressure die casting material, it must be properly soaked to dissolve all the carbon and prepare the austenite for hardening. For these materials, the core must be soaked at 1885 Fahrenheit for at least 30 minutes. If the die is massive enough, the surface may be at temperature for too long a time. In these cases, we quench the workload when the surface is at 1885 for 90 minutes. Grain growth may occur if held at these temperatures for greater periods of time. Grain growth is detrimental to impact toughness. Osmotizing high speeds is very critical, again, due to grain growth. High speeds like N2 can be osmotized as high as 2250. We use an additional high temperature preheat for high speeds. In this example, the final preheat is at 1950. We want to minimize the time the tools are at their osmotizing temperature. Placement of the low thermal couple is critical. We need to make sure we are accurately measuring the part temperature. Placement is critical since we hold only two minutes at the osmotizing temperature. Quenching, arguably the most critical step in heat treatment. A few things to keep in mind when heat treating tools. Tool seals are hardenable, but they need a minimum of a two bar quench. By bar, we mean the pressure of two atmospheres. If you measure pressure with a gauge, it will be right at 15 PSIG. Check with your heat treater to make sure he's doing at least two bar. High speed steels perform much better with faster quenches. It's not unusual for to quench these as much as six bar. Slower quenches will result in more chipping of the tool in use. Hot works used in high pressure die casting applications can be quenched up to 20 bar. What is being shown is being quenched at eight bar. Naturally, the surface will cool faster than the core. Again, when the surface is cooled to 600 degrees, the core is still around 800. Thicker cross sections can have a greater spread in temperature between the surface and the core. There are lots of rule of thumbs to tempering. Tempering is done to balance strength and wear versus ductility. The general rule of thumb is that you want to temper for one hour for every one inch of cross section with a two hour minimum. Again, check with your heat treater and make sure he's tempering for this period of time. This is critical for hot works. They are very sensitive to time. In some cases, we will retemper at the exact same or slightly less temperature to drop the hardness of one or two. There's lots of debate on single versus double temper. Most materials will not receive additional benefit from a double temper if the temperature is under 600 degrees. High speeds and hot work steels often require three or more temperatures. Why do you need multiple tempers? On some steels, not all of the austenite hardens on the quench. After tempering, generally anything over 600 degrees, the austenite will transform upon cooling from the temper. Tempering again softens the fresh marking site from the previous temper. These micrographs show D2 at both high and low tempering temperatures. Notice that the whole hydro exhibits greater decomposition. This can relate to better toughness. As you can see with this temper curve, stainless exhibits a very flat curve from around 400 degrees to 900 degrees, meaning as you increase the temper in this range, you don't really need the hardness. The sweet spot for 420 is right at 500 degrees, give or take a few. This puts the material in the best combination of strength, ductility, and corrosion resistance. If you ask for a hardness of 44 to 46 HRC, you can see the curve is very, very steep in this region. Usually, we have to temper them multiple times, sneaking up on the hardness. 
it is not unusual for us to increase the temperature by as little as 5 degrees between tempers. Tempering above 800 degrees is not a good idea. This drops the corrosion resistance of this material. As a commercial heat treater, the lion's share of material we see pertains to H13, A2, and D2. This is over 80% of the tools by weight. The good news for the heat treater and the customer is this results in two heat treat cycles. Most materials will fall into one of these two cycles. This allows the heat treater to provide overnight service. Additionally, this reduces your cost as well. One overnight cycle runs at 1850. Here you can see the materials that fit into this group. The other is at 1750 for A2 and S7. Naturally, if it's a large tool or processed to an industry standard like NACTA for high pressure die casting materials, it will take longer to process these than just overnight. Larger dies may be in the vacuum furnace for 12 to 24 hours, and they will receive three 12 or more hour tempers, making it impossible for overnight heat treatment. Let's look at some of the more critical details for heat treatment. These details can have a dramatic impact on the tool's overall performance. This is a transformation curve for H13. This graphically shows what happens to the microstructure during the quench. As we look at this curve, NACA requirements mandate a quench rate of 50 degrees per minute from 1885 to 1000 degrees. This would be curve number 5 on the chart. As we're quenching, when the temperature reaches 1500, we hit the carbide curve. This is the secondary carbides that form on the grain boundaries, dropping the toughness of the material. At around 600 degrees, we start forming lower veinite. In this material, that also drops toughness. As it cools around another 100 degrees, the martensite starts to form. This is the desirable phase. Finally, around 200 degrees, all the martensite is complete and no more hardening will occur. As you can see, even with a dramatic increase in quench speed, you will still form some secondary carbides. Increasing this rate to prevent secondary carbide formation puts you at a great risk of cracking. In summary, the hardening here starts to happen around 600 degrees for this material. Naturally, the surface reaches this temperature before the core. We will show you how this influences your parts in just a minute. Secondary carbides precipitate on the grain boundaries. This effectively weakens the steel and drops the toughness. This is the reason 420 hot works and high speed steels, re steels require multiple bar quench. Here is a micrograph of P20. You can see it is a very uniform structure. There's no secondary carbides. Here is 420 ESR. Notice the structure is not as uniform, mainly because you can see the outline of the grain boundaries from the secondary carbides. Here's an example of why quench rate is important for ductility. A test was done on 420 bolts. These bolts exhibited the same hardness, the same strength, but not the same ductility. Here is an example of a load displacement curve. The bolt was placed in a tensile machine and pulled until failure. These bolts were quenched with fans similar to what you would see with a tool ring furnace. In this example, the bolt broke just 18 seconds of pulling time. <clears throat> this bolt was quenched at three bar in a vacuum furnace. It made it almost to 45 seconds. That's a 250% improvement in ductility. Let's look at things that can go wrong during heat treatment. We'll also focus on ways to help reduce risk. Tool steels processed in vacuum furnaces are generally very, very deep hardening, meaning the tool will harden from the surface to the core. On our H13 example, remember the tool started to harden around 600 degrees. Here's what happens. The surface reaches 600 degrees, hardens, and locks into place. Once the core reaches 600 degrees, the tool will start to harden. The steel expands as it hardens, the parts will behave like a balloon. When you look at any tool, imagine it being blown up from the inside like a balloon. We've talked about instrumenting your tools and how critical that is for measuring of the heat treatment cycle. If your parts do not have a hole that can be used for measuring temperature, we will use a load block. You pick a block that is close in thickness to your tool. Again, make sure your heat treater is doing this. As you can see, it looks like a balloon. 
This block has been cited enough times that you can visibly see this effect. Your tools are doing the exact same thing, just to a smaller level. If you have non-balanced cross-sections, they will move. One thing I've noticed over the years, steel will do what steel wants to do. Predicting what it wants to do can be a challenge with that in mind. As you look at a cavity, there's more material on the bottom than on the top. It will have a tendency for the corners to curl up. Knife edges have less material. They will typically banana bow like this example. As we process your parts, loading can play a significant role. Inserts should be placed in the center of the furnace. You want the tool to uniformly transform as it starts to harden. If the tool is too close to the bottom or sides, those surfaces can start to harden before the balance of the die resulting in greater distortion. Long parts should be stood. If you lay them down, not only will one side quench more than the other, but gravity can let your parts creep and distort. Movement during heat treatment. I have a heat treater's favorite question. When you ask a heat treater this question, you'll usually get a pretty big number for a couple of reasons. One, you generally do not have the equipment needed for the complex measurement. The majority of feedback that we get is from our customers. We usually hear about the ones that distort more than normal. Two, we don't want to give you a number that is too small so there is not enough stock. No one is happy when that happens. With that said, as a general rule, tool steels with primary carbide are more stable during heat treatment. They generally move around a thousandth inch per inch or less movement. Tool steels without primary carbide move a bit more, around one to one and a half thousandths per inch. Hot works to neck specifications can move quite a bit. At least three thousandths per inch should be anticipated. It's not unusual to have 65,000 stock present. Design plays a role. Design can help in both distortion and crafting risk. Remember, parts are balloons. If you balance the cross section, you can reduce the risk of cracking and distortion. Let's look at this tool. The arrow points to an unbalanced cross section. There is less mass here than anywhere else on the part. This is a more balanced cross section. Understanding some designs are fixed, but this just gives you an example. Key ways remove material from one side of the part. This can allow it to banana bow. This is more balanced. Another example of an unbalanced key shaft. This would be better balanced. Cracking risk management. Let's assess risk. In these examples, topics at the top of the list are at higher risk. One, larger parts. The bigger the part, the bigger the balloon. As hardenability of the alloy increases, so does your risk of cracking. One of the worst design features are webs associated with large masses. Lack of radii, this is more important for larger cross section. Welding, sharp keys, slots and grooves, blind holes. Thin webs, these are high risk. As you can see, it didn't work out too well here. Thin webs harden first. Once they lock in, larger masses on either side harden out, and it's going to crack. Notice not just the web cracks. In most every case, it will turn and shoot right through the die. Here's the fix. You remove the web. You can see that it is gone. Thin webs. Again, as the part starts to expand from the hardening, this can be a crack point. Here's the fix. Using the diagram in the burr to remove the sharp edge. Incomplete machining. When the feature does not completely break through the cross section, it can leave a sharp notch. Here you can see one of these conditions under the bird. The fix is to remove the material and open up the region. Here's what was laying underneath the die grinder. Knife edges. Here is a knife edge. Pretty hard to see, but this is a very sharp edge. Again, the fix, taken down to the shoulder of the hole. Radii. The bigger the better, but at least an eighth of an inch. Bigger parts will need bigger radii. Here's one that failed with an insufficient radius. Another example, yet another, balloons do not like sharp features. Welding. Just not a good idea to weld. Understanding that in some situations you have to, but it increases risk. There is a heat-affected zone that is creating stress. 
the sharp notches at the little toe. Pretty easy to see it as I cause in this one. Look how far this crack opened up. There is an amazing amount of stress present before tempering. If you do have to weld, please tell your heat treater. In some cases, we can stress relief or add an additional pre to help reduce stress in the tool. Welding the tool steels is very tricky. Be sure to follow all recommended procedures for welding. Be sure to use the correct filler material by sources that can add hydrogen while you are welding. Be sure to use proper preheating and postheating procedures. The example we just showed you is an extreme case. There was a sufficient buildup in the center of a large mass. In an ideal world for this extreme case, it would be best to rough machine the weld, especially in the toe area, to help create a radius. EDM works by vaporizing steel. There is a rehardened layer. There can be huge stresses created by this process. This is a recast layer. Now this is pretty hard. The rehardened layer, extremely hard. The tempered down heat affected zone. All these conditions create stress. Let's talk about heat treatment guidelines for EDM. Sections over two inches should have these minimum tempers. This helps provide enough ductility to reduce the risk of cracking during EDM. Specifying tempers is more important for EDM than specifying hardness. You can see the requirements in the table. Let's look at some guidelines for a large section that will be removed after heat treatment. Let's say this outline is what will be EDM. Drill a couple holes as shown, connect the holes, this should be done before heat treatment. This helps lower stresses while you're performing EDM. We've covered a lot of ground here today. What are some of the important takeaways? There's two types of tool steels, those with primary carbide, like A2D2, and those without, like S7H13. Large, connected, primary carbides really drop toughness. The more forging they receive to break them up, the better. This is where powder metal grades really shine. Secondary carbides really drop toughness. This is why you need multi-bar vacuum heat treatment. Properly design the heat treat cycle to fit the behavior of the steel and the configuration of the tool. Don't mix large and small cross sections together. Properly instrument workloads. Parts of balloons. Design with balanced cross sections when you can. Balloons don't like sharp features. I wish to thank you for your time and attention. Please feel free to contact me if you have any questions. This is my direct phone number and email. Thanks, Rob, for your time and your expertise. Um, right now, if anyone has any questions or comments, please use the question box or the chat box. And right now, we do not have any. Um, Again, uh, this webinar has been recorded. It'll be available to view on the NTMA website. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Uh, Rob or Phil, do you have any other questions or comments for the audience at this time? No, I just wanted to say uh, thank you again to everyone. And uh, I think Pam's going to send everyone a little takeaway sheet. And again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to contact Rob or myself. Um, Rob will probably be more helpful, though. <laughs> Okay, hey, again, thank you both so much for your time and your expertise. We appreciate it. Thank you. Everyone, have a great day.